pretty much the same thing. You know, uh, the safety guys are pretty much looking for what we like now. I mean, but really, the real defining thing, you know, because a lot of people went, you know, with like variations on the bars. Oh, really? And frames uh, have variations and all that. Sure. But mountain are everything out of what we like now. I mean, but what do you say? The pivotal moment for me is when you just fire yourself, it makes a trail, and then you found that you didn't know how to get rid of it. Until you said to Gary, it's not live. <laughs> This is really wonderful. Next, we have uh, Charlie Kelly. Going to take it from there and maybe tell us about some of the bikes you broke. Two days, uh, no. Anyway, uh, you know, I didn't really mean to get into the bike business. It was real accidental. Um, very few people get to take part in anything that changes the world, and those that do, very few people get to improve it, you know, but whatever my part is in this process, we did change the world. And uh, for me, it was largely accidental. I had a passion for bicycles that developed out of my friends driving my car into the ground, and I figured if I got a bike, they wouldn't borrow that. So uh, uh, I got a bike, and uh, later on, I met this guy, Gary Fisher, and we uh, shared a house, and we had the fancy race bikes, but uh, Gary had some old one speeds that uh, were a lot better for going, going to the grocery store than you know than uh, fancy Italian race bikes. So we got a couple of what people would normally use for just a beach cruiser or a town bike, and we started riding them around. And then this uh, third individual said, "Hey, why don't you come up to the house and we'll go out riding on the, the dirt trails like we used to do when we were kids?" And that guy's name was Fred Wolf. He's not here right now. Uh, and it was so funky, we had two bikes and three guys on that first ride. You remember that, Gary? We had two bikes and three guys, so one guy had to run. And, and we were pretty tough guys then, so one guy ran after a mile or so, hey, now give me a bike, you know, you run. And uh, so uh, that's a pretty funky start there, but uh, uh, one thing led to another. We started riding these things out, uh, you know, on a regular basis uh, until... Uh, one thing led to another, and we, we finally had a race in October of 1976, and that was supposed to settle for all time who was the fastest guy on the bike, but what we found is it only settled for that day. And uh, the fact that we had a race, an actual organized race, started to uh, draw in guys from uh, other localities that were doing essentially the same thing. Uh, the guys from Larkspur started showing up, and then shortly after that, uh, the guys from... Uh, uh, Berkeley started showing up, and uh, and the repack race really became the meeting point for and the testing ground for the equipment. Uh, and for me, of course, I, I at some point I started keeping the records and promoting the events. Uh, and we we put up posters in the bike shops, and the poster would be pretty cryptic to anyone who didn't know what it was about. But uh, uh, we were we were having the races on a regular basis, and for me, that was my inspiration for I, all my friends could kick my ass on, uh, on the downhill, so I thought, hey, better equipment is what I need. And uh, uh, I had a guy named Craig Mitchell build me what is, as far as I know, the first mountain bike frame uh, made for that purpose uh, from scratch. And, and unfortunately, I didn't, wasn't very happy with it. And uh, later, I asked Joe if he would uh, make me one of his frames, you know, and. Uh, so, for me, a pivotal moment was certainly getting that breeze frame, but there were three or four pivotal moments for me. One of them was, would be the first repack race, which obviously led to many more. And uh, another was uh, the day that Gary Fisher shows up with uh, nine of Tom's frames in the trunk of his BMW. It was a really beat up BMW. But, uh, uh, and he said, hey man, Tom made these frames and says if nobody in Palo Alto wants to buy them, uh, you want to help me sell these bikes. And we literally reached in our pockets and how much money you got, I mean, whatever. The total came to a couple of hundred bucks. And we went and opened a checking account and, and said, uh, let's say, what do we call our company? Well, uh, Mountain Bikes. All right, that sounds good. You know, and uh, 
actually applied for a trademark for that name, and uh, the trademark attorney dropped the ball and got that trademark denied. Uh, I think about him late at night still. <laughs> and uh, I hope, I hope he knows what he dropped the ball on. But uh, anyway, we didn't, we didn't own the name Mountain Bikes, so we just used it for our company name. But, uh, and then uh, a few years later, a couple of years down the road, that was 1980, uh, we tried to start a club. The club had one meeting, and at that meeting I said, well, my girlfriend and I will do a newsletter for the club. And so we put out a little newsletter, and I've got copies of it in the back of the room there, but uh, we called it the Fat Tire Flyer. And it was just a mimeogra or a photocopy thing, a few pages, not, not a lot in it. But we made the mistake of writing on the first page, issue number one. <laughs> issue number one, well, what does that tell you? That must be an issue number two coming along, right? And people said, well, the club never held another meeting. We, we, we did a newsletter for a club that didn't exist. And, uh, but somebody said, well, when's the next issue coming out? Oh, all right, all right, I'll do that, man, you know? And one thing led to another, and my magazine took over my life for seven or eight years. And uh, it became the first really written record of what we were doing, although we started the magazine a few years after we started the, the activities. So uh, uh, it was all accidental to me. I never meant to be in the bike business, and I'm not now. But uh, it was just nothing more than a passion for bicycles and being surrounded by guys with similar passions and the competitive spirit of a bunch of 20-something guys uh, I never meant for it to happen, it was all an accident, but what a heck of an accident, huh? Anyway, two weeks is not enough, five minutes is not enough, I'm going to stop here. If you want to talk to me, find me later. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Gary, you're up next. Uh, I started bike racing in 1962. I was 12 years old. Um, I was born in Oakland. We moved to Guam. Uh, my dad was in the Navy. Then we moved to Beverly Hills. My grandfather worked for Hal Wallace. Hal Wallace was a seminal Hollywood publicist. I learned publicity early on. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, I came to Marin County when I was 15. Uh, what the. Redwood High School in Larkspur. Met the uh, kids of the Larkspur King game. And it was like a lot of drumming, you know, drumming circles before it became popular. We're talking the 60s here. Yeah, I did meet the Grateful Dead. They were at the uh, bike race in Pescadero. They did the Trail del Mar. And yeah, I did become Garcia's and all those guys' friends. But you know what? I got the hell out of that, man. I just about killed me. Uh, I was doing light shows and everything. I met Charlie. I was living at the New Rider of the Purple Stage's house over the summer. I met Charlie there. He's a rooting for the Suns. Um, Charlie, like, um, you know, anyway, we became roommates. Um, I was the first category road racer by then. And I'll tell you, uh, riding dirt, messing around with the Canyon Gang was a blast. We had, you know, as Joe pointed out before, man, we had ridden every square mile in Marin County, Sonoma County, everything on the road. But the off-road, well, this was the birthplace of low growth, Marin County. And during, uh, yes indeed, during the 60s, they stopped the Eisenhower Interstate Freeway System in San Francisco. That was Joe Alio and the Sierra Club, we love him or hate him, that started um, that whole movement. And Marin County was this huge piece of open space, much similar to Saratoga, San Mateo County, but Tom populated too. But um, I started hanging out with those guys, and to me, the ratio of pushing the bike 80% of the time and riding 20% of the time, that was the only part that sucked. And to me, it just seemed so completely logical to put gears on a bike, and well, if you're going to have gears and a free wheel, you better get some righteous brakes. So started to scavenge that whole thing together, you know, and uh, built one for Charlie, built one for um, Fred Wolf, and Fred Wolf was the inspiration for the nuts and bolts of like, man, Fred would say, I want to be able to ride up this hill, I want to be able to ride up that hill, and the guy was 200 pounds and super strong and would tear normal stuff up. So we developed bikes, you know, I helped those guys 
and develop bikes. I and mean, then bikes were being developed. I mean, this mongrelization. There were guys going out and finding the kind, you know, Mark Van Denny and his perfect bikes. Joe had perfect bikes of all the proper Morrow rear brake, the Schwinn front brake and everything. And my bikes with these, these ugly, mongrel, laughable things that I could ride 80% of the time. You know, that was the thing. And that started to change things. Then things, you know, this thing, it was obvious it was going to take off. I mean, oh my God, by the time the first repack came around, I was the first category road racer. And like, barely anybody in town knew of my exploits or anything doing that because we were always traveling somewhere else in the state. There were very few road races in uh, Marin County, but the repack race went on every couple of weeks. And, you know, we go out and try to get prizes for that race, and all the bike dealers wanted to give us prizes. Because, man, people would come in after the day after the repack race with all this trashed out equipment. We busted so many bikes, that was a whole deal. You just hilarious. busted them up. You know, and I'd walk down the street in Fairfax, and people would run out of bars and say, Gary, you got to beat that guy Joe Breeze from Mill Valley, damn it. You know, it was like that. And this was, you know, amazing. Charlie started writing in his, you know, his time in the truck because, I mean, Charlie is the most, you know, and he's a great writer. I was writing for Bicycle Magazine. I sucked as a writer. I mean, I, I like, I got terrible grades in English and I got the job because I was, you know, a road tester. I could ride a bike and everybody knew it, you know, and it was a, just, I really wanted to keep that job because I got free bikes all the time. It was a charmed existence. Um, at any rate, um, you know, I said, you know, Charlie wrote a story about the repack, and I gave it to uh, my editor at the time, which was Gail Heilman at CM Publications in San Rafael, California. And she looked at it and said, well, our readers really don't like BMX stories, so forget it. You know, then Rodell Press on the East Coast bought it, and Chuck McCullough, the, the uh, publisher at the time, looked at it and said, oh, okay, and they ran it. And then I'll remember there was Outside Magazine going right. out there. And I said, you know, and Charlie submitted his story, and he rejected it. And I said, Charlie, call him up, ask him why, and re rewrite the story, and resubmit it. And he said, Dan, yeah, yeah. And finally, you know, I talked him into it, and he did it. And he sent the story, and, um, you know, they rejected it again. And I said, call him up again. And they called him, he called him up again. He resubmitted it, he got the thing done. You know, and here it was. It's really great publicity for this whole thing. And it was before we had any bikes really available. Now, Tom, I'd known Tom. I mean, what a badass road racer he was. And he had, like, these radical designs on his road frames. And at the time, I went to Albert Eisentrout, Jeffrey Richmond, and Tom. Tom built three frames in three weeks. Jeffrey Richmond built one frame in three months. And Albert Eisentraub, it took five years for him to build the first frame. I said, Tom is hot shit. You know? And Tom, Tom, you know, he built three frames. I bought one for, you know, it was 400 bucks at the time. And I bought one for, and it was also for James Backway. And Tom, and I was willing to take the third, but Tom said, I want this for myself. And then Tom showed me this new handlebar he done, the Bull Moose handlebar. And it was kitchen, and it was cool. And um, it was amazing. And we, we suddenly were doing the publicity to get this thing out there, you know, to like let people know. And it was, it was so much fun. It was like peddling drugs. Oh my God. You take people out on the bike, they come out with eyes as big as I got to have one. I got to have one, you know. And the previous, you know, I mean, previously we were doing bikes, you know, Alan would be making bikes, I'd be making bikes. It'd be the scavenger hunt looking for the frames and the hubs. Okay, these guys down in Saratoga, forget it, man. You look at their bikes, they had the wrong hubs, they had the wrong brake levers. It's like, I, I challenge any of you guys to ride that bike downhill. They themselves wrote in their own papers, they said, these bikes didn't really work. We really preferred the single speeds over these bikes. You also look at their gear ratios, they sucked. You know, you couldn't ride them up hills that well. And, you know, these guys, I saw them, I saw, I was trying to develop my bikes. I'm riding a cyclocross right and I'm going like, Holy shit, these guys have got fat tire, multi-gear bikes. I looked at them and said, nice try, but uh, almost, you know, almost. And we kept developing the thing. And Craig Mitchell, that guy took his own life up in uh, Montana. Don't live in the 
you know, some guy accused him of being gay. This is like about 15 years ago, and the guy was a genius. He did so many crazy, innovative things. Another guy, Charlie Cunningham, too. I mean, developed the sloping top dude, did all these crazy things. It was, you know, Marin County had this open space and had this abundance of money and had, you know, it's still today per capita. It's uh, possibly the, the world's high, or the nation's highest spendings on sporting goods equipment. So there was, you know, plenty of people to, you know, fund the thing. Of course, Joe made his first bikes, and he thought, I mean, Joe, as I remember, you said that you thought that um, the 10 bikes would forever take care of the notion that I want a $750 mountain bike, that, that they wouldn't sell it well, and by the time... I, I didn't say correct. that, I think Jackie Phelan said that. <laughs> all right, but anyway, we were all amazed that, you know, what started as an activity, you know, Larkspur Canyon Gang, it was, you know, a $5 bike, a $10 bike, you go get that at Goodwill. Nobody really gave a shit. You go out and ride in the woods, you go do a moonlight, uh, you know, uh, derby, and um, you do a bike pile afterwards, and anybody that fell down during the derby, you had the right to ride their bike over, and, uh, you know, those bikes would get run over and uh, totally toasted and everything, and you wanted a cheap bike that, man, you'd spend thousands of dollars on a mountain bike. That was a novel notion. It was as novel as, I mean, Times are ripe for the mountain bike because the notion of riding off-road, people would look at you and go, you're riding a bicycle up there, off-road? Oh my God, this is insane. But at the same time, the unit, the bike was so practical. It was what people needed. Yeah, I too shared with Joe, like I was, I am still like Joe, a bicycle create crusader. And that um, I had, you know, in 1962, I mean, I was 12 years old, 13, 14, I mean, people thought I was the stupidest geek. They'd see me out of my bike stuff. I was the uncoolest kid in school, and I didn't give a shit, you know, because I knew that bikes are right, and it is good. Marketing and publicity aspects and really contributed a lot. <laughs> no, it's nice. Um, in a perfect follow-up after mentioning Charlie and uh, flamboyance, we have Jackie Phelan. It's kind of tough to follow the um, apostle of a splatter going saint. <laughs> but I think we're all there. I think too that. Um, Hey, I have religion. It used to be the Church of the Rotating Mass, but I think I like the Church of the Splattered Gray Saints a little bit better. <laughs> One of the things that's real obvious in uh, listening to these great stories is my connection to pretty much everybody here and how uh, so many of you Splattered Gray Saints had a, a role in my getting started. So I figured um, might as well just mention a couple. Um, I was taken on uh, my, my woodsy bike, my Raleigh five speed, by my friend Daryl to uh, Fairfax to see this thing he was calling the Appetite Seminar. It was an annual ritual, he said. And whenever we would pass people on the bike path, it was a 25 mile ride to get to Fairfax from San Francisco. There'd be these guys on these bikes with arms outspread and their hair flapping and he'd go, there's another seminarian. And I go, what do you mean? Oh, well, we're going to Appetite Seminar. Okay, so. We get to Fairfax and there's all these people with huge wide handlebars loading their bikes up onto a truck and Daryl says, oh, look over there, that's Gary Fisher. You need to go meet him. So I went and met Gary Fisher. Then he said, that's Charles Kelly over there. So I obligingly headed over and shook Charlie's hand and said, hi, I'm Jackie. Say, why are you guys putting all those bikes in the truck? I go, oh, there's a big hill to get up to the, the Appetite Seminar start. We're gonna take pictures. And I go, oh, no kidding. Okay, well, how far is that? A couple miles? All right. So me and Daryl rode our bikes. He was on a Jack Taylor 10 speed, and I was on this, um, you know, five speed Sprite girl's bike with a basket. Oh, yeah, and Daryl and I were the only people wearing helmets. So we sort of stuck out. And people were wondering, where did they come from? And me, the helmet was not just a, a normal um, helmet. It was a helmet with a duck sitting on top. 
Because in stuff. Fairfax, you really, uh, I mean, sorry, in San Francisco, that's the only cure for me for road rage is to make them laugh before they kill you. So the duck always stayed on the helmet, and people were kind of uh, wondering about people on the wrong bikes. We were clearly on the wrong bikes because they were smooth tires. And we cut it up, and everybody was, you know, aligning their bikes in those famous pictures that you'll see sometimes, I guess, on uh, Charlie Pell's website, right? One, one place, yeah. And uh, they were, okay, we're going to take a picture, and Daryl looks at me and says, see that hill over there? And there's this huge three-part serpentine slope covered with street. If you can make it to the top of that, I'll give you a big surprise. And uh, I had toe flips on it. And I somehow made it to the top without getting off or pushing. And uh, I never did collect on the, the surprise, but I'm pretty sure that, I mean, Gary might have been there. Might have said, what in the hell is she doing on that wrong bicycle with the basket? Uh, then I waited for everybody to catch up and go down in front of me. Huh? You were truly beautiful on that ride. I remember you. Gary, you're so nice. You have beautiful form he, on a bike. You thought I had beautiful form on a bike. Well, that's cool. So that was his uh, first sight, is this chick with knee socks, striped knee socks, and on a Raleigh girl's bike. And, um, and me waiting for everybody to bomb down, because I definitely would be in the way, because I had never gone downhill on skinny tires. And I had to sing at the top of my lungs to stay um, sane. Fast forward five months later, I'm riding my road bike around Tiburon and meet Gary, and we trade phone numbers, and he becomes my coach. Somehow I end up being a, a pretty decent road racer because he's the guy talking into my ear, telling me exactly what to do in the criterion because I had no idea how you even rode a road race. But that year, 81, they had announced that women would be finally allowed to race in the Olympics. And maybe you didn't know that women were banned in the Olympics on a bicycle. They were also allowed to be in a marathon for the first time. You know, somebody had conclusively proven that the uterus would not fall out on the duress. <laughs> so anyway, I um, tried like crazy to be a roadie, but I just could not do it. And because uh, I, I couldn't conform quite enough to their sartorial codes. So, um, but he took me up to a, my first mountain bike race on a much better bike. We borrowed a, a breezer, as a matter of fact. And I did the first Whiskey Town with them and took seventh place. There were 78 racers, and um, I was the seventh human, which was totally cool. Because of all my road strength, I was able to uh, conquer all but six of the guys. There was the winners, Scott Nickel was the second. I can almost name the other four guys. And then uh, you know, I've still got my results, in case you want to look at them. Um, <laughs> but what uh, I think the contribution that I ended up making, because of my uh, kind of breaking into the scene on the wrong bike. And then, as soon as Gary and I broke up, I was suddenly persona non grata on the road rides. And because I couldn't be dropped, the guys had to actually let me get to the front so they could take an alternate route behind me in order to lose me. And uh, at this point, I realized, you know what, you can't get anywhere going practicing by yourself on a road bike if you don't have people to negotiate turn turns at 35 miles an hour. I think I'll try mountain biking. They seemed a lot friendlier. Um, and P.S. if I ever get famous, I am going to be so nice to every single newcomer I meet. So help me, goddess. So uh, my contribution was to be friendly to every single person that I ever met, so help me, goddess. And that happened to be uh, every single girlfriend who was along for the ride and got dropped. So um, I'm probably running out of time, but let's just say that I lifted up the back of the circus tent that at the front said, fun for boys and started ushering women in as much as I could, saying, hey, this is really fun, you don't have to race, just come ride with me, I'll show you how to not fall over. And uh, at the time I was racing unbeaten, there, there, there didn't seem to be women that wanted to uh, really race mountain bikes, so I was accorded my own gender, because I, I rode like a guy, but I was obviously not a guy, and I couldn't be a woman. So anyway, luckily I was racing uh, the guys, they didn't like separate us out. And, uh, and so some of you guys knew what I would like because um, because I wasn't separated out from heavens. I think I might be repeating myself. Anyway, I uh, as a as an unbeaten champ, I made no impression at all. But as the uh, woman that showed probably five or six thousand women how to ride a bike safely and never get hurt and not have to enter a race, I think that was my real um, contribution because I think it's the safest, most fun thing to do, but that's not something you really hear about or see when you look at the ads, read the stories, 
and count the number of collarbones broken by um, this or that race. So I, I can't remember what the guy's name with the red hair is. Or that Australian kid who keeps breaking them, breaking Cadell Evans. Anyway, that's like considered normal, um, hurting yourself, and that it, it happens to be a myth, and it's time for me to quit. So I just want to say. Uh, my part was to let the gals have a good time and um, make the story a little more known. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I have to confess that I'm one of the people she let in. It was because of Jackie's encouragement that I got involved in the sport. And even though I'm now more involved in road cycling, my long time involvement with the sport is largely due to your mentorship and encouragement. So. And also wiping our faces after we got done racing. So when the press took pictures of us, we didn't look quite so bad. <laughs> so that leaves one rider left. That's Otis. And, uh, I'll just let you have your speech. I'll keep mine short, I promise. <laughs> um, thanks so much for all of you being here for the first thing, and your patience and everything else. We're all here because we share the same thing, and that's a passion for cycling. You know, for me, you know, when I, my father taught me how to ride my bike when I was five years old, and the training wheels came right off, and once I was able to ride the bicycle, he would come home, I'd come home from school, I'd follow him with a 57 Volkswagen Bug, Back to school, in a couple months, I was allowed to ride any place I wanted to in the city of uh, My whole life, I've had a view of Mount Tail Pius, wherever I've lived, whether it's been in San Rafael, Fairfax, Mill Valley, or San Francisco. So obviously, Mount Tam is a very, very important thing for me. Uh, you know, I've had very close connections with all these people here at this table, um, especially with Joe. Uh, part of my passion for bicycles is, is also its transportation. You know, we uh, did many miles together on the road, together racing in the road. Uh, I was introduced to uh, what we like to call the mountain bike, the balloon bikes, uh, by a roommate named Mark Vendetti, who had uh, gone to Redwood High School with some drone cannon night. And he kind of showed Joe and I what the best hub was, the Morrow hub, and get put front brakes on there with the Schwinn strap on cantilevers. And the best year of uh, balloon, like for me, was like the 41 Schwinn Excelsior. And, uh, at that time, around that time, I started working as a firefighter. And we're, for us, it was like we're riding you know, road bikes with skinny tires, uh, sew ups that get, get flats e easily, gears. Here we have these bicycles, one speed, comfortable. And we could go on Mount Tam and discover so much of Mount Tam where when I would hike before, I could only do maybe one quarter of that amount. And if you look at all the old pictures, you'll see us wearing long sleeve, you know, you know, Levi, you know, shirts, big boots and everything else. And that's because at that time the trails were all basically our handlebar whip. And almost most of the trails didn't have trail signs. Joe would always bring the map. He'd also bring his flower book because we had to, you know, type all the flowers that we saw on the rides also, which is very important. So we'd be like, you know, flying down this trail, here's this great flower. It's like, oh, for God's sakes. You know, so I somewhat learned about flowers on the rides. Um, but for us, here we're riding these bikes, met the firehouse, different people that had no interest in bicycles, well, of course, we're all working bike shops at the time, thought these bikes were very, very cool and actually were. And since at that time, we're all road racers, we're actually connected with the industry, all of us in some sense. And people always ask, well, you know, why did the mountain bike happen or what made it happen? Most people in this room at one time rode off-road at whatever age. We all did. I did long before I, I met Joe. Um, what the difference was is that somehow we were connected to the bicycle industry. We weren't just um, you know, long-haired you know, hippies having to be riding on these one-speed bicycles. Yes, we were. <laughs> we were also you know, Cat One road racers who were involved going to trade shows, who were involved with different members of the industry that had Mike Senior come by you know, in his van selling us bike parts. So for me, it was hard to say who invented the mountain bike or how the, the mountain bike started, but in a sense it was from all of us and our passion for the bicycle and actually having some connection to the industry. And in a sense that's what sparked this whole thing to go. And for me the most important part is it got America involved in cycling. We wouldn't be having click shifting. We wouldn't be having all the different parts you see on the bicycle now, on the road and on the mountain bike. In a sense if it wasn't for all of us getting it going and getting it more popularized, getting America involved in cycling, 
which still doesn't evolve as much as I'd like it to see, made a difference for the whole world industry for bicycles. And I'm glad to be just a very, very tiny part of that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> that was a great wrap-up. So should we go ahead and start taking questions from the audience? No questions? Oh. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Okay. Keep going, right. All right. All right. Over to you, Paul. Okay, so I think we've got a question here in the front. I'm wondering if any of you feel any degree of frustration that the mountain bicycle has become so ubiquitous that it's actually become the standard bicycle, even where it's not as ideal or appropriate. Uh, yeah, it's funny. A few years back, I was down in Mexico. Mexico has a culture of a bike. Uh, traditionally called the uh, turista right there and you know it's a double top tube has sort of like uh, downturn bars and everything and you see all these guys are pimped out just so cool they've had like a whole like uh, racing for, for going on for years and I tried to buy one and it's like shop after shop I went to they said we got mountain bikes man we don't have this style of bike anymore I finally found one it was an indigenous bike they make it down there it's a different room bead size and anything you ever saw and you know these crazy looking tires that are orange and different things and so yeah I mean like anything that becomes mass and homogenized yeah there's a, there's a part that turns you off on it it's like one of our locals you know Jerry hide and rack don't you guys yeah, 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 yeah. Jerry quit mountain biking because it became too popular right so there's always that side of it, and also that when you say the ubiquitous bicycle in the world, a lot of people don't realize that, but it is worldwide. You go to third world countries, they all make mountain bikes now, so called mountain bike and everything. And yeah, I guess, you know, in a lot of ways, it's the best. I mean, Mexico in particular, their roads in the cities are these cobbles that are very rounded and not square. I mean, it's the roughest riding I've ever done in my life. And these wheels used on the Turista bikes are huge. So, yeah, I feel a bit, personally, I feel a bit strange with the whole thing. So I feel wonderful on one, one hand, and like, like Tom was saying earlier, you know, that more people ride bikes and everything, but feel a little strange on the other that I am partially responsible for homogenizing the bicycle. I, I'd, like to, I'd, I'd like to add to that. Uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know, uh, you guys don't get this experience, but we, the, the, the guys and a few others that aren't here, uh, could go to any city in the world and we will see pretty much the same diamond, not, not the multiple shock absorbing, hydraulically braked racing bikes, mountain bikes that are really currently popular, but essentially the diamond frame, fat tire, flat bar bikes that we started making in 79 and 80 are pretty much the standard bike for the rest of the world. and. Like I say, without trying to divide up who did what, we all had a hand in it. And how many people have the opportunity to go to any city, in any country in the world, and see something that they personally influenced? For me, you know, it's sometimes it's just hard, it's so overwhelming. How could anyone, how could I have had a hand in that? But in fact, we know that we all did. So uh, there's a, a satisfaction that goes beyond money or anything. We, we changed the world and we actually improved it. And who gets a chance to do that, you know? So sometimes you have to step back and say, wow, did we really do that? Well, it's out there. There it is. You know, I'm not sure I necessarily agree, agree with that on, on, on the bicycle. As far as I was commuting to a class over in Hunter's Point uh, a couple days ago, and I rode by a guy on an early 90s Bridgestone mountain bike with slicks on it, with a nice set of panniers, and he was commuting to work. And here was his, on his mountain bike that he was making work you know, for his commute bike. In a sense, what Joe is doing now, you know, moving from more of the mountain bike thing to more of a transportation bike is, it's all a process. You can still, you know, take a 90s, you know, mountain bike. This guy had no suspension, just an old Bridgestone lug frame. It was like a great bike. I, you know, chatted him up along the way while, while we were cruising along the Embarcadero saying, what a nice bike you have. You know, so that is, it's not that it's really changed. You can, you can use a bike for whatever you want to. It's another way to get somebody on a bike. I kind of wish that I could uh, get the esteemed folks at this panel to change things back to uh, replaceable parts and get Shimano to stop making everything new for the sake of making things new and uh, maybe back off that silly 9 chain and 
have repairable things. So that uh, you can repair 1965 old Sprite without being an archivist or a curator of that particular bicycle. So change it back, eh? <laughs> no, I think uh, it, it's, it, uh, I see some very good things. I, I'm sure you recognize the, the good things. I, in, uh, in a lot of places where people did ride a bicycle once upon a time, it made the, the bicycle relevant again, the mountain bike did. And uh, that, that's a wonderful thing. And, and whether it's a, a, a mount, uh, it, is, it might be a mountain bike, uh, but yes, like Otis mentioned, it's, people are adapting the bike to their needs to be able to use them in everyday life and get around in a self-sufficient manner. And I think that's, that's wonderful. Uh, I, I don't really, I, I think that outweighs the, any, any downside to it. I think it's gotten more people on bicycles uh, is the net, net gain. And, and another part of that too is that a lot of people that they got on bikes are actually realizing that they can, okay, a lot of people who got on mountain bikes way back when uh, were new to bicycling. They weren't coming, some people came from road bikes, but there were a lot of people who saw the mountain bike and, and like I said, it made it, the bike relevant to them. And they've gone on to realize that, my golly, I can use a bicycle not just for recreation, but for transportation in day-to-day -day life. And, and I think an, an important point of that, or a, a hope of that, is that uh, the people as popular as we as cyclists uh, might see cycle, uh, um, as popular as we might see cycling today, you know, that we do it, and isn't it, well, Lance is winning the tour, and da 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 da. I see this as representing, the people cycling today as representing just 10% of the potential of people riding in the United States. And because we have a bicycle now, a, a revolution in bicycling here in America, people are figuring out how to incorporate bicycling with their day, day life. And that, I think the mountain bike had, uh, some uh, influence on. So John's got a couple comments too, I think. Oh, sociology. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, I can follow up on, on various remarks. Um, I think one thing that the other speakers have touched upon that I very clearly remember uh, was the um, um, stream rideability of mountain bikes very early in their history. One of the things that is notable about, about the mountain bike is well, you can go in and been plenty on the current completely tricked out mountain bikes with suspension and uh, disc brakes and oh, mysterious fibers, titanium, carbon fiber, all made in outer space by virgins to keep it at the highest quality. Um, but the fact is, if you get on a 1981 or 1982 mountain bike, even at low price points, and strip it up, oil the chain, it's still a serviceable bicycle. And when you get on that bicycle, it is fun and pleasant and easy to ride from the first trip around the block. This was definitely not the case with a top-end road bike that preceded it, say, in the late 1970s, which catered, as inevitably happens, to the wannabe racer crowd and was a skittish, uh, difficult bike if you had not ridden anything beyond your, your uh, kitty bike in, in years. Uh, now we all know that those bikes are superbly adapted to their functional traveling fast on roads and uh, uh, you would you'd make very few changes in them at any, but the fact that a mountain bike was easy to get to ride early on was of great importance. As I saw sales taking off, doing business with, with Gary and Tom and, and running Cupertino Bike Shop, I simply, like any merchant, was, you know, humble. That's very hard for me to be humble, but you're humble in the face of market preference, and the bikes came in the back door and went out the front very fast. Um, it hasn't been a complete takeover, despite the fact that they are uh, widespread and probably still the biggest sellers at, at lower price points in the market. Um, in the top-end market that has been the specialty of the Cupertino Bike Shop when Spence founded it and when I owned it and when I sold it to Vance Strock, Mountain bike sales have plateaued, and the uh, tricked out, fundamentally unrideable to a novice road bike is, is now the top seller, along with all sorts of specialized things, tandems and, and, and what have you. But this is um, a stable market share within an enormous expansion of recreational cycling, not only in the United States, but throughout the industrial and modern world. Um, 
the uh, if you're going to look at this in terms of the present day from the context of cycling history, what you are seeing in these parts of the world is a very dramatic shift away from utility cycling, away from child cycling to discretionary recreational cycling by adults, adults with discretionary spending, hence the high price points of a lot of the bikes. Um, and the mountain bike has uh, clearly an assured uh, place in this market. But if you, the first thing you have to understand about why the market mountain bike has been so popular, and I confess it's puzzled me. I thought the boom was going to end, and it went on and on and on and on and on before it finally started slowing down in the late 90s. Um, and not receding, just slowing down. Um, um, is that uh, it served a very definite niche. It expanded the scope of recreational cycling, but the demand for recreational cycling for the tremendous growth of endurance sports. Uh, leisure provides what work denies. Uh, in a world of a, uh, of, a, of a knowledge economy in which everybody sits around and has to be clever and scheme and think all day, writing briefs, uh, getting the most energy efficient path in an in a, uh, in integrated circuit, uh, uh, you know, coming up tri with tricky audits for Sleazy Corporation, whatever it is, right? something you have to do to think for a living. Nothing appeals so much as mindless exercise. It's the only place from which you can gain release from the tyranny of your ever-acting mind. That explains the growth of endurance sports, whether that be running, swimming, uh, I don't know, climbing ropes for all I know, and certainly cycling. They all appeal to the same people. Um, uh, a triathlon, a runner, all of them understand immediately by cycling your point to the point to the stage where you're so exhausted you can't remember your name except you wrote it on your left hand. Um, it's fun. Well, that's a, that's a worldwide trend, and the mountain bike has got its very definite niche in terms of exploration, recreation, uh, fire roads, single tracks all over the place. Uh, it appears to be for reasons I, I certainly don't fully understand to have been the right uh, consumer product at the right time in the history of cycling. Yeah. You did that without notes, didn't you? Have some more questions from the audience? It's a really good one. Right? Yeah. Um, Bones, can you describe the legendary WordPress for us? I had two friends in Larkspur, uh, Robert and Ian Stewart. And uh, he, Ian was my roommate, and he was the guy encouraging me to get a bike like his. Uh, you know, I, I had seen uh, Charlie's bike around town, and it had more parts on it, definitely. I like the idea of uh, more parts, brakes, gears, and so forth. Um, but there was no place in Marin that had an available frame. And his younger brother, Robert, had been up in Oregon four-wheeling the summer before and had run across this guy with a dismantling yard uh, in uh, Klamath Falls. And he had actually spent the last 30 years dismantling neighborhood bikes and repairing many of them, but many that didn't get repaired got thrown on the pile. And uh, there, it was out near the edge of town by the railroad tracks. Uh, Anyway, we went, me and Ian went driving up there looking for it. We, we got to the edge of Klamath Falls. First gas station we stopped at, we said, well, is there a, is there a, a bike shop uh, called Wokus around here? And I said, oh yeah, I'll just go through town, uh, go to the railroad tracks, just pass it, turn right, halfway down the block, on your right. So we go there, and uh, the, the guy um, probably would be defined in, in in terms from uh, my youth is simple. And he had spent uh, perhaps 30 years <laughs> taking apart these bikes. He had boxes and boxes in his basement of pedals, you know, headsets, rear brakes, uh, every component off the bike for hundreds of bikes were all in his basement. He had six stacks out back that were maybe 25 feet long by five feet high of just frames lined up with the headsets facing one direction. So one guy got up on top and the other guy ran along looking at headsets and siding down the frames to see if they looked straight. And the guy on top would pull off all the frames and, and until he got down to the one we wanted. And, um, it was an amazing thing, but it's probably not there anymore. <laughs> you know, uh, metallurgy on steel just doesn't survive very well out, out in the rain and the cold. And, snow every, every winter, and, uh, so I've never gone back looking for them. Uh, 
it was really an, an experience. We went up, brought back 50 the first time. Uh, the truck was loaded completely down, swaying as it's coming down I-5. And two weeks later, we went back and got 50 more, and he sold each bike to us for three dollars. And for that three dollars, we got to pick the frame, pick the wheels, and pick all the components to go and make up one bike. So we cleaned them out pretty thoroughly. I see another question back there. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, after this kind of in, this kind of invention phase that you described in the talks, uh, when you, you realize, wow, I can re I'm really gonna not only maybe sell this to a few of my friends, but I'm I'm gonna have a broad market for this thing. So. And uh, on total, I lost money. So. <laughs> lost a lot more than I made. But Charlie, would you agree that that we were like we had no money? You know, we started, I think it was 600 bucks we started with. Yeah. Anyway, it was less than a thousand, that's right. for sure, man. And we financed the company on, uh, well, the very beginning, $500 deposit, and uh, we knew how to float checks with UPS and COG, <laughs> you know? We never bounced a check. And um, I'll tell you, uh, there were people lined up out the door, and that's why, uh, that's why people could, you know, I was always wondering, man, it's only a matter of time until, like, we get knocked off by some of the big guys. They're gonna figure it out. We used to buy parts from Mike Sinyard all the time, and he figured it out pretty quick. And <laughs> that, that, uh, you know, for being totally underfinanced and everything, we were just selling everything we could possibly make. And Tom here, who left the building like Tom usually does, <laughs> he, uh, he was the killer frame builder. You know, insofar as he could turn out the big numbers and everything, it was amazing. You know, and uh, John Finley Scott here, he. Uh, Invested a lot of Tom's frames, and then he gave us some of the frames to work through, you know, and, and it was $10,000 in kind, and indeed, we paid John back. The next loan I got was from the Japanese government, believe it or not. It's strange. It took years to get the banks to loan us money and everything, but it was obvious that there was money to be made, you know, after a while, but we didn't care, man. We wanted to spread bikes, you know. We were just bike freaks that loved the bike life, and nothing better in the world to be working the bike with bikes and turning people on. It was like doing a drug. It was selling a drug to people. It was like making people like changing people. It was like that Bob Burroughs. He was in the end of that root pack film. You know, said I'd rather be plugged in having his bottle of wine. That guy was a San Francisco fireman. He was no athlete at all. I made a bike for him, and I thought, wow, well, man, this is going to be a bike and, uh, that's going to wind up in the garage after you know six months. No way. It changed his life. And that changed my mind. At, at first, I thought these bikes are for athletes, and then it was like, I, uh, you know, like this is a rolling party, a lot of fun. Uh, you don't have the cops, cars, and concrete to deal with. You know, you go out and spend all the time in the world to do. And it was like Joe was saying, a perfect entryway into the cycle world. It really was. I have to add to, to Gary's uh, story there. Yeah, I, I loaned Gary ten thousand bucks, and he finally got things going, and uh, this is a comment on his uh, entrepreneurial uh, skills. He didn't pay me in cash, he paid me in bikes. I own the Cupertino bike shop, I go up to Bren, stuff my car full of his bikes, take it down, shove them back to our shop. They went out the front pretty fast. So he got a broader market for his product while improving his balance sheet, and I got bikes with no fresh investment of upfront capital to put on the floor. It was a very sweet deal and I'm a very good businessman. And I, I've been an academic uh, more than anything else in my life, but unlike most sociologists, I have nothing but profound respect for entrepreneurial talent. So here's your man. Any more comments on this topic? Well, let me just say that, uh, you know, most of the time going to work with Gary in the morning at our shop called Mountain Bikes, the idea of making money was not really foremost. The idea was, man, we got the coolest bike shop in the world and it's ours, you know? And, you know, maybe making money would be, would be nice, but we're making bikes. And that was what the passion was for. The passion in my life has never been about money. It's been about bikes. And... Oh, and rock and roll. Oh yeah, all right, playing in my band. All right, thank you.
seen if someone's got one. We've got a gentleman in the back back there. I've got a question for Jackie Feeling if she's coming back. She's standing right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> And the second part is, will the boys ever play nice together? Question two is hard to answer, but uh, I definitely think that the more women that are on bikes, the, uh, the better everything's going to go globally because uh, it's going to mean that women have earned enough to buy the damn thing. And in order to earn more, they're going to have to learn how to read. That means uh, education for women is going to have to come up all globally. Um, and unfortunately, Mod Bats isn't about that. It's just about getting middle class women on bicycles. But uh, you got to start somewhere. And when mom's happy, everybody is happy. So uh, for me, Wombats, which is uh, an acronym for Women's Mountain Bike and Tea Society, which is a para religious uh, feminist organization um, that is, in fact, the Church of the Slattered Gray Saints. And uh, the older I get, the older they seem to get. But back when I was 25, uh, we didn't have a name for the club. It was just sort of like, let's go ride and promise you won't kill me. And because uh, people tend to look at me and think I'm going to hurt them. But I won't. I'll go slow. So anyway, uh, the club ended up becoming kind of well known for going really slowly. And um, the newer the rider, the more popular you were. And you know? once you got too good, you probably had to start racing or something. So Wombat still exists, but it's very undercapitalized. Um, it is the thing that I guess I've had an 18 year head start on, and uh, Specialized has not borrowed yet. But they, they'll get around to it. Trust me, they've, uh, Trek has already used their women specific design campaign based on my website and stuff. A lot of borrowing has happened thanks to Wombat's creativity. But I'll just keep uh, creating, and maybe who knows? Um, Maybe there will be like a global, I mean, obviously they're going to, everybody's going to double their sales when more women buy bikes, right? And then we'll be back to 1890 when all the uh, bike industries had to uh, take out ads in the magazines in order to um, allay Victorian fears about women riding a bicycle and losing their femininity. And they, uh, at the beginning of the mass market, they had to do something. <laughs> and they used fiction book format to do it. And uh, the advertisers were all bicycle companies. Nowadays, the women are begging the bike companies to take them seriously. It's kind of an interesting reversal. Um, back then, it was the bike companies trying to convince society to let their ride bikes. So anyway, uh, it's uh, always a cycle, and I look forward to the next turn of the cycle. Does that sort of answer it? Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, that's really what W-O-N-D-A-T-S, Women's Mountain Bike Ampersand T Society. The T stands for time. May you always have time to ride your bike. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. I have to say, Jackie's always been feminine, but I've never known her to go slow. Are we done? All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'd like to thank the audience for Thanks for the invitation. Hello, Chicago.